chests he went up to a mountain and when he was seated his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying quick little aside here uh, back in those days the teacher would usually sit and those who were listening would stand I think we should bring this back because after three services you know I want to sit too so let's just do that today I'll sit here and you stand what do you think no, no. it'd be good because you fall asleep every service no, I'm kidding made that up oh but okay but listen to what this says here seeing the multitude he went into a mountain and when he was seated his disciples okay, came to them and he damn chips. see th these words were given to his followers not to the masses not to the crowds they were given to those who were following him this phrase he opened his mouth is a colloquialism in greek it's used to describe something that is solemn grave and dignified in other words this is a phrase that is describing some weighty statements that are about to be given. These words were not addressed to fair weather followers, and Jesus had those, and they're still around today. You know, there are people that have an interest in Christianity, an interest in the teachings of Jesus, but they haven't really committed themselves to him. You know, you may be surprised to know that there was a time in his ministry when Jesus was actually quite popular. We focus a lot on his betrayal, his crucifixion, but for a time, Jesus was the talk of the town. Huge crowds formed wherever he went because after all, he was performing miracles. He was restoring sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and Damn. healing an incurable disease known as leprosy, <laughs> even resurrecting he people back up. to life he again. To, he, but his most popular miracle the without his question might. was what when he gave a free ass. lunch to everyone and the feeding of the 5,000. But when the Lord addressed ass. the topics of sacrifice and deeper commitment, the crowds began to shrink and ultimately the crowds even turned against him. No, these words were given to committed followers here in the Sermon on Get the Mount. Get that damn bitch out of here, people will say, bitch. All the religion I need is found right damn. there in the Sermon on the Mount. Really? Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? That fucking pissed because me off. Because I think these are some of the hardest teachings Jesus ever gave. I think it's harder to keep the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount than even the Ten Commandments. And I'll that tell fucking you why. pisses me off. Because the Ten Commandments like deal primarily with external actions. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. These are things we do. The Sermon on the Mount deals with the heart. Jesus says, you've heard that it has been said, but that I say to you, if you off. do it in your heart. So this is a much harder thing to deal with. So these are words that are given to people that have totally committed themselves to him. People that understand what he was teaching in the Beatitudes, remember, it start off with, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, and so forth. Blessed is the man or the woman who sees himself as they really are before God, spiritually bankrupt and destitute, and they mourn over the, their sin, and they repent of it. These words are for believers only. Let's read some important introductory words now of the sermon. On the mount matthew chapter 5 verse 17 jesus says do not think that i have come to destroy the law or the prophets i did not come to destroy but to fulfill for assuredly i say to you till heaven and earth pass away one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled a jot or a tittle would speak of the crossing of a t or the dotting of an i Verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Now, Lord, as we read your words here in the Sermon on the Mount, as we understand how you want us to live, help us to hear it Man, fuck this and shit. see it the way you I'm want us to and help ass. us to internalize it and live it out. Remask Speak me, to bitch. us as we open your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus says, you will in no way 
enter the kingdom of heaven. I remember when I first read those words as a brand new Christian. I thought, what on earth? How could my righteousness ever exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? You see, the scribes were men who had dedicated themselves to the study of the law of God. They would carefully go over it, interpret it, copy it in the manuscript form. And then the Pharisees, they were a select group, never numbering more than 6,000. And they spent their time going over the law, debating the law, quoting this or that rabbi to make their point. And Jesus comes along and says, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you will, have, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, first of all, Jesus was setting himself apart from all the rest. Because normally when a debate would ensue, a rabbi would be quoted. Well, you know, Rabbi, rabbi Gamaliel says thus and so. Oh, well, wait a second. Rabbi so-and-so has a different view. Oh, well, there's this other rabbi. Jesus says, you've heard it said before, but I say unto you. Jesus was not recognized by any rabbinical school. He did not need the authority of another teacher to support him. He was the authority, and he spoke in that manner. He says, I have not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. The word fulfill means to carry it out, to make it full, to get to the heart of it. Damn, Everything that it. the law was pointing to was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. All the Old Testament types laid out in Leviticus and Numbers were fulfilled in him. He was the Passover lamb. He was the burnt offering. He was the scapegoat. He was now going to fulfill everything that the law was pointing to. But ironically, they accused him of breaking Sabbath day because he dared to help a person in need on that particular day. And Damn, that's because they had completely twisted and perverted what the Bible was saying on these topics. And Jesus was getting to the heart of the matter. So when he says that our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, here's what he means. Their righteousness was based on their works. Their righteousness was not real. Theirs was a self-righteousness. No, he says, that's not enough. You need real righteousness, and that is given to you when you put your faith in Christ. It's called imputed righteousness, and it's placed into your spiritual bank account as a, as a result of you being justified by faith through your belief in Jesus. So he says, I'm getting to the heart hmm. of the matter yeah. now. This is the bottom line. And your righteousness needs to exceed theirs. And now he lays out what that actually means here in the Sermon on the Mount. He deals with a lot of important Damn. topics, helping us to form our worldview. Topics like hatred and sexual sin and marriage and Damn. divorce, speaking the truth and retaliation and loving others. The Sermon on the Mount is not about giving the bare minimum, but the maximum you can give as a Christian. To borrow Jesus' own words, it's about going the extra mile, taking it to the next level, and being a radical, sold-out follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, the Sermon on the Mount is heavy-duty stuff for hardcore Christians. The spiritual lightweights need not apply. If you're a fair-weather follower, you're going to be blown away by what we're going to talk about today. If you're not really interested in living as a Christian, this is going to be stuff that you will say, I can't do this. But if you want to be a real follower of Jesus, this is what he has laid out for each of us to do. Again, this is for believers only. So let's read some more words. Matthew 5, verse 21. Damn. You heard that it has been said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and therefore remember, your brother is something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. And first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say unto you, you will by no means get out of there till you've paid the last penny. You have heard that it has been said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her 
in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, we'll pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, we'll cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Wow. Now what does this all mean? I have no idea. God bless. No. <laughs> Jesus is getting to the heart of the matter, as I said. The Sermon on the Mount is about the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And here's what he's saying. It has to be more than just external pressure. In other words, let me ask you this. Why don't you go and steal something that you really want? Why don't you go ahead and kill that person that bothers you? Why don't you commit adultery? Well, sometimes, if we're honest, we would say, because I don't want to face the repercussions. I don't want to be arrested for stealing. I don't want to go to prison for killing. I don't want that on my conscience. And, and I'm afraid if I commit adultery, I'll get caught. Okay, well then let me ask you a follow-up question. If a set of circumstances were to arise where you thought you could steal that something and get away with it, would you then do it? Or if you thought you could get away with adultery, would you go ahead and commit it? If your answer would be yes, and we have a problem, because really that means in your heart you still want to do these things. Our heart needs to change. And though there is a place for those external reasons, we must have a change of heart where we won't want to do those things anymore. So instead of just dealing with hatred, Jesus gets back and nips it at the buddy and says, let's talk about anger. Let's talk about what's really going on deep inside of you. Verse 22, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you'll be in danger of judgment. How many of you have ever been angry with your brother or your sister? Or, oh, get your hands up. All of us have. Mm. We all have been angry. The Bible is not saying you can never be angry. There's even a place for righteous indignation. But more to the point, there are times when we are angry with one another. You know, get that whore kids out of get here. Kids get upset with their parents. And parents with their kids. And husbands with wives. And wives with husbands. And friends with friends. And Christian brothers with Christian brothers, this happens, we get angry. Sometimes we say things we should not say and we find ourselves apologizing for it. This is normal day-to-day -day living. This is not what Jesus is dealing with, someone who has a little bit of anger here and there. This is talking about a person who has become bitter, who is developing a, gl a grudge, who is nursing and feeding it. The word that he uses here for angry could be translated a settled anger, malice that is nursed inwardly you know what i've discovered some people like to fight it's not even what they're fighting about they just like to scrap they like to mix it up they like to debate they like to argue they always have to have their opponent the person that they're upset with and the reason you know this is as soon as one issue is resolved another one takes its place they just like to be in some kind of confrontation in some way shape or form jesus is talking about a person like that a person that is nursing bitterness a person that is actually allowing the anger to grow where does this anger and hatred start sometimes it starts with envy i think it was uh Shakespeare, they're called Envy the Green-Eyed Monster. And you remember that the first homicide uh, that was ever committed was done by Cain toward his brother Abel. Why? Because his brother's sacrifice was accepted and his was not. He was envious. Well, how come his sacrifice is accepted and mine isn't? And that's how it often starts. You know, one person gets that promotion. One person gets something you want. One person has something you don't have, and envy begins to develop, and envy turns to anger, and anger turns to bitterness, and bitterness turns to hatred, and effectively, you're murdering that person in your heart because you're spreading lies about them, and you're slandering them, and, and that's what your whole life becomes about. So Jesus says, don't let this happen. It should not be true of a child of God. First John 3.15 says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Notice it does not say they're like a murderer. It says they are one. 
That's how severe it is. First John 2 9 says, He that says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness. Don't tell me you love God and you hate your brother. If you hate your brother, you hate your sister. If your heart is filled with this deep malice, the Bible is saying you're not really a Christian. So we need to ask God to change our heart if this is the way we feel toward others. Now, the Lord tells us in verse 22, if you say to your brother, Raka, you'll be in danger of the council. He's like, Raka, what's that? Well, it's hard for us to understand what this phrase means because there is no modern equivalent in the English language today. A literal definition of Raka means a brainless idiot, an empty head, a bonehead. It, I think it's not so much about the word. It's about the attitude. This is speaking of a superiority over another person. It's the phrase that comes from an arrogant contempt. So if you say to your brother, you're worthless, or you say you fool, which means you're a godless person, both of these ideas convey the attitude of someone that sees himself above someone else. And Jesus is dealing with that. Now he shifts gears and he talks about lust in verse 27. You've heard it said of, of those of old, you should not commit adultery. But I say whoever looks on a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now look, that doesn't mean if you see a pretty girl or a good looking guy as you are not seeing right now, but will probably see later outside of church. But um, It doesn't mean that you notice someone is attractive. You say, well, there's a pretty girl. Oh, there's a good looking guy. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about seeing that person, but then allowing your mind to go to the wrong place. Uh, in fact, the word that is actually used here to describe this phrase, whoever looks on a woman, isn't referring to a casual glance. It's referring to the continuous act of looking. Not an incidental or involuntary glance, but an intentional and repeated gazing with the express purpose of lusting. This is the idea of a man, or even a woman, that would put themselves in a place where they would look at others to stimulate, feed, and encourage their lust. And Jesus is saying this is like committing adultery. Now sometimes you don't do this on purpose, but you're exposed to something that you wish you had not been exposed to, but then you have a choice as to what you're going to do with it. A good example is uh, David, the king of Israel, who was up in his rooftop patio, and uh, he happened to notice a very beautiful woman named Bathsheba bathing herself, and uh, he couldn't have helped noticing her, I suppose. And I'm not quite sure that Bathsheba did not know that he would have a good view of her and did not put herself in that place. There is a responsibility on her part, too. She was culpable. She cooperated with David. She could have refused his advances, of course. But uh, David saw her. So there it was. Now he could have turned away from it, but instead he acted on it. You know how the story unfolded. He had her brought up to his chambers. They had sex together. Uh, she was pregnant. And then instead of just coming clean and admitting it, he wanted to make it look like her husband was the father of the child. So he called the husband Uriah in from the battle and wanted him to spend the night with his wife. But Uriah wouldn't do that. And ultimately, David had Uriah sent to the front lines and he was killed in battle, effectively had him murdered. And then David married Bathsheba, thought he covered up his sin. And then, of course, uh, Nathan blew his cover and confronted him and said, you've sinned against God. And then tragically, the child died after it was born. It was just a mess, you see. But it all started mm -hmm. with a lustful look. And so we need to think about that. That is why Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look on a woman. But a better translation would be not to look lustfully. You're going to see mm. women and men, but don't look lustfully. Mm. You, you actually sometimes <laughs> have to literally turn away. Maybe you're walking down the street and approaching you with some gorgeous girl or some great looking guy and, and your mind's going to the wrong place. Sometimes you need to avert your gaze. Just look away. Don't look that way. Maybe if you're watching television and something comes on the screen, you know it's going to stimulate lust. You need to stop it. And there's a button on your remote control. It's usually red. If you push it, images disappear. It's called the power button. 
use it. Don't go on your computer and just Google random words and just click whatever sites pop up. You might have images appearing on your computer screen you wish you had never seen before. Be careful. Guard your thoughts. Guard what you expose yourself to. This is the idea that is being conveyed. Let me add one thing to this. Not only should men not be looking lustfully at women, but women need to think very carefully about the way they present themselves so they don't encourage lust. Don't look at me that way, girls. You know what I'm talking about. The way you dress. What you wear. What you don't wear. Well, what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Well, how should I dress? Do I have to wear sackcloth? I don't know. Sackcloth is nice. No, I'm kidding. You can still be stylish. You can dress, still dress in a cool way. But just maybe apply this principle. Act as though... Jesus were picking you up and taking you out that night. Would you feel comfortable wearing what you're wearing? I'm going home right now. <laughs> the sad thing is it's guys. I'm going home. <laughs> break. Some guys Woo! would lust after a treat. This is true. But there is a responsibility on the part of the girl as well. There's a word that we have no, no, taken out no, of our vocabulary. No, no, we need to no. get back again called modesty. And Christian girls are to apply it. So here's the answer. Look at verse 29. So if your eye causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. So there you go. your right hand sins, cut it off. Because it's better to lose your arm, or your hand, or your eye, than to not make it into heaven. What does that mean? Well, obviously, Jesus is not speaking literally. Because if the problem is in the heart, what good is gouging out an eye, or cutting off a hand? If the right eye were gone, the left one could still look lustfully. If the right hand were gone, the left one could still carry on sinful acts. Let's understand what he was saying in the culture of the time. In the Jewish culture, the right hand represented a person's best skills, a most precious faculties. The right eye represented one's best vision, and the right hand one's best skills. So here's what Jesus is saying. Do whatever is necessary to keep yourself from falling into sin. And sometimes you have to take drastic measures. Maybe you're in a relationship right now and you've allowed it to become sexual and it's dragging you down. You need to probably just cut that relationship off right now. It needs to be a serious step. Maybe you have a problem with internet pornography and, and you do, well, you know what? At the very least, put a filter on your computer, but maybe you need to just stink and unplug the computer and stop going online. I'm not saying for everyone, but I'm saying for some people, if this is a weakness and a vulnerability, you may have to take Damn. extra steps in the right direction. Stupid. Do whatever it takes to walk right before God. That's the I idea of gouging bro. out an eye or cutting off an arm. Dumbass. Verse 12 says, let us lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. Excuse me, let us lay aside the weight sin that so easily besets you and uh the weight varies from person to person what may be a weight for one may not necessarily be a weight for another what brings one person down doesn't necessarily bring another person down so we each have to make these decisions before god stupid this let's read some of the hardest Why? statements jesus ever made may be easy for you, but they're not easy for me. Uh, verse 38. You've heard that it has mm. been said, an eye for an eye, and two for his two. I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to see you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asked you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. 
You've heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Needless to say, these are high standards. Turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, loving your enemies. Now, here's the question. Are these standards by which we govern society? And if so, how can we justify having military and police? The 19th century Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy wrote a book entitled What I Believe, in which he gives the conclusions that he came to after reading and rereading the Sermon on the Mount. Tolstoy said, and I quote, Christ forbids the human institution of any court because they resist evil and even return evil for evil. Tolstoy also believed that criminals love good and hate evil as we do. And he did not think that a Christian should be involved in the army or the police force or the courts of law. One man who was dramatically influenced by Tolstoy's teachings was Gandhi. Gandhi believed by practicing these teachings, you could bring about a perfect state where punishment would end and prisons would be turned into schools. Sounds good, but it's wrong. What? The teachings of Jesus? No, their interpretation. The Sermon on the Mount was not given as a set of principles by which we govern our society. So if somebody means harm toward another, the police officer is supposed to turn the other cheek? If we're attacked by a foreign power who want to destroy us, we're supposed to just go the extra mile? No, there is a place for self-defense. There is a place for standing your ground. The biblical teaching of the Sermon on the Mount was given by Jesus for believers to live by. But if you want to know how a society should be governed, that's found in verse 38. You've heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. In Exodus 21, it continues on and it says, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. Our modern equivalent would be tit for tat. This was the Hebrew civic justice system. Its purpose, according to Deuteronomy 19.20, was so that the rest will hear and be afraid and never again do such an evil thing among you. This was never carried out by the victim, but by the legal system. It was a merciful law because it limited the judgment. It matched the punishment to the offense. God has established government. He has established military and he has even established the use of force when necessary because Romans 13 says obey the government for it is God who put it there all governments have been placed in power by God so those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God and punishment will follow for the authorities do not frighten people who are doing right but they frighten those who are doing wrong so do what they say and you'll get along well then speaking of the soldier, or in our case, the police officer as well, the Bible says he's God's servant, doing good. And he does not bear the sword for nothing. He's God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment for the wrongdoer. Now what is a sword used for? It's used to usually kill a person. A modern right. equivalent perhaps would be a gun. God delegates vengeance or the enforcing of justice to the government. Otherwise, evil people will dominate. And so, according to scripture, government, law, enforcement, and military all have their place, a God-ordained place. In fact, the Bible even uses a soldier as a model of what a Christian ought to be. Uh, Paul spent a lot of time around Roman soldiers, and he analyzed their gear. We were in Rome after we went to Israel, and I saw this little store that sold uh, recreations of Roman armor. And I was fascinated by it and was looking at various pieces. The, and these were actual reproductions of, of what it would have been like. They went back to the original drawings and designs. So they had the breastplate that you put on. They had a leather one, and then they had one made out of brass that was very heavy. And they had the helmet, which, of course, they had to put on my head and try out and then the sword you know and and the big large shield that the roman soldier would carry and so forth and 
It was fascinating to study that armor. Paul spent a lot of time doing so because in Ephesians 6, he talks about putting on the armor of God. Uh, you know, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and so forth. But my point is that God would never have chosen a dishonorable profession as an illustration for a Christian. He used the idea of the military to show how we should follow Jesus. Because 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, Endure sufferings, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And as Christ's soldier, don't be tied up again in the affairs of this life. Uh, for then he cannot satisfy the one who has enlisted you in his army. See, I bring this up because some would say the Bible teaches pacifism. Jesus was the ultimate pacifist. Jesus was the first hippie, right? Peace and love, man. No, actually, that's not true at all. Jesus administered justice when he drove those money changers out of the temple with a whip and overturned their table. He told his disciples of coming dangerous days where they may need swords. And Peter mentioned that they already had two swords. Now, why would they carry swords? For shish kebab later? No, for self-defense. So this is important. God has established human government to administer justice. It is acceptable for a Christian to defend themselves and to exercise their rights. Even the Apostle Paul, when he was falsely charged and beaten, he exercised his rights as a Roman citizen. The Bible is Damn. not saying that the Christian is supposed to be some kind of a doormat. Now, having established what this doesn't mean, let's talk about what it does mean. This is the advice of Jesus for a specific situation in which a believer is being persecuted. These are not mechanical rules, but principles for meeting the personal wrongs that come to those that follow him. There are times for the sake of the kingdom and for the salvation of a soul will take the hit. We'll turn the other cheek. We'll go the extra mile. The idea is do what you can to reach a person with the gospel. Uh, Paul said in Romans 12, 19, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God for it. It's written, I will repay. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So the idea here is that we are doing what we can to influence a person. Uh, Jesus actually uses the example of turning the other cheek in verse 39. Now, let's understand, this is not so much about someone just coming up and punching you in the face. This is more the idea of an insult that is offered. Because back in these days, to be slapped in the face was a deliberate insult, a demeaning and contemptuous act. Uh, so someone comes up and they do something to offend you. A modern equivalent, I don't know what it would be. Maybe to spit in someone's face. It doesn't physically hurt a person, but it's insulting. And actually, it can really anger you. Uh, it might be using certain words. You know what? They say this to you or something else about someone you love. Or sometimes it's a gesture. You see these gestures on the road quite frequently. <laughs> I won't see what they are, but they have something to do with birds. And we'll leave it at that. And people are so quick to do this, you know. They'll cut you off and then do the gesture to you. Like, what is that all about? And when that happens, you, ah, you know, you want to do it back or even worse. No, Jesus is saying, don't do that. Now, is this an easy one to live by? Absolutely not. It's very hard. Even the great apostle Paul struggled with it at one point. The uh, order was given to hit him in the face. And he turned back and said to the high priest, God, I'll smite you, you whitewashed wall. Someone said, you speak that way to the high priest? Oh, I didn't know he was a high priest, sorry. And I think Paul, being a member of the Sanhedrin, knew who the high priest was. I think Paul struggled with this like anyone else does. But here's the point. Even if you struggle with it, the objective is to try to win a person to Christ. Verse 40, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your coat. The tunic was an undergarment. Everyone would have one. The cloak was the outer garment that served as a blanket at night. It was indispensable uh, for living in Israel, especially in the cold evenings. Jesus is saying, go further than they asked. 
Don't just give them your tunic, give them your cloak. Go the extra mile. See, back in those days, a Roman soldier had the right to ask any citizen to carry his armor for a Roman mile. A Roman mile was a little bit shorter than our mile. And I already mentioned that armor I was looking at. And one thing I noticed was how heavy it was. The breastplate was really heavy, as was the helmet, as was the shield. And so a Roman soldier would see someone say, here, carry my armor. You have to do it. So Jesus says, you know what? If they ask you to carry their armor, take it for the Roman mile, then go an extra mile. Normally people say, take your armor, it's so heavy. Yeah, I'll go an extra mile. By the way, let me tell you about my faith. Kind of the idea of a captive audience. Go the extra mile. So you can do that at work. Instead of giving the bare minimum, give more. Sometimes your co-workers will get mad at you, frankly. They don't work so hard, you're making us look bad. But you see, you understand that your boss is not your employer, it's the Lord. So you do it for the glory of God. Go the extra mile. Go a little bit further than that which is required. Do it for the sake of the gospel to win the hearing of the person that you are trying to reach. Try to turn your enemies and friends. And know this, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're going to have enemies. Why? Because darkness doesn't like light. Jesus said in John 15, if the world hates you, though it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But no, we're told to love our enemies. Verse 44, bless those that curse us, do good to those who hate us, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute us. Don't strike out, don't give tit for tat, but love them in a positive way. Abraham Lincoln said, quote, the best way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. End quote. Do you have some enemies right now? Try to win them over, not just as a friend, but as a follower of Jesus Christ. This attitude blows people's minds when they see a Christian willing to forgive, a Christian willing to turn the other cheek, a Christian willing to go the extra mile. It was the attitude that Abraham had toward his nephew Lot, when he offered him the best land. It was the attitude that David had when he did not strike back at King Saul, though he was trying to take his life. It was the attitude that Joseph had when he extended forgiveness to his brothers who had meant him dead. And it was the attitude that young Stephen had when he prayed for those that were stoning him, saying, Lord, don't lay the sin to their charge. Maybe as we've talked about some of these things, you've realized that you're guilty of some of the things Jesus has addressed. Maybe you're harboring hatred in your heart towards someone right now. Maybe you're feeding lust and it's getting worse. It's like a wildfire taking you over. Well, we need God's help to live by these principles. No one can do this on their own. And who is a greater example? of what Jesus taught than Jesus himself. Everything Jesus told us to do, he practiced. He told us to turn the other cheek. He literally did that when they ripped the beard from his face. He told us to go the extra mile. He literally did that when he carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. He told us to love our enemies and he literally did that when his first words from Calvary were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those words were so radical, so unexpected, that they produced the conversion of a man who was crucified next to him. A hardened criminal who had seen it all, done it all. And yet when he heard Jesus forgive the ones who had treated him this way, he believed on the spot and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yes, Jesus forgives. And maybe some of us need his forgiveness today. If we've broken some of these commandments, these principles given to us in this sermon, this is the time to say, Lord, forgive me for that and help me to live as your child in a way that honors and glorifies you. Maybe some of you hearing these things would realize I'm not a Christian at all because I do have hatred toward people. 
or I have been a fair weather follower. I'm a person that follows him only when it's convenient. I haven't really gone to that next level of total commitment. As we close now in prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a first-time commitment or a recommitment to Jesus Christ. Let's all pray. Lord, we would admit to you that we fall short of your standards. We would acknowledge, Lord, that we Shut have sinned mind. against you, but we also oh, fuck. would thankfully acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and paid the price for every wrong that has ever been done. And I pray for any person here, Lord, that does not yet know you, help them to see their need for you, and help them to come to you now, we would pray. Stupid. Our heads are bowed, and our eyes are closed, oh, and we're praying. I see where I couldn't have taken Maybe God all night. has spoken to your heart today. <laughs> you are not really a Christian. You don't really have Christ living inside of you, but you want to be one. You want to change. You want to be forgiven of your sin. You want to know God in a personal way. You want to go to heaven when you die. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, if you don't know right now that you would go to heaven when you die and you want Christ to come in your life in your life today, I want you to lift your hand up wherever you're sitting. And I'm going to pray for you today. If you want Christ to come into your life, God bless you over here on this side. God bless you. Anybody else, just lift your hand up and I'll pray for you today. God bless you up there in the balcony. God bless you as well. Anybody else, lift your hand up now. If you want Jesus Get that to come whore out your of life here. and forgive you of your sin, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you up in the balcony. Maybe you're outside in the amphitheater. I can't see you there, but I would ask you to lift your hand up as well if you want Jesus to come into your life. And you up in the court building, please lift your hand also. I can't see you, but the Lord sees you. You want his forgiveness today. Maybe some of you have been like a fair weather follower. You know, you, you say you're a Christian, but you know you're not living these principles. You're not even trying, but you want to. You want to be a real follower of Jesus, and you're willing to commit yourself to do this today. If that's your desire, would you lift your hand up? And I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, just lift your hand up now. God bless each one of you. Now I'm going to ask that all of you that just lifted your hand, if you would please, stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer of commitment or recommitment to Jesus. Again, you that lifted your hand, just stand to your feet wherever you are, <laughs> up there in the balcony, here on the ground floor, outside I'm the, ear, in the your work. amphitheater, stand to your feet. You up in the court building, just stand up right now. <laughs> I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment. Anybody else, just stand now. Even if you didn't lift Jesus your hand, but you want to make want to this lose. commitment or recommitment to Jesus, that whore stand up now. Or that damn word. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else in this final moment? Outside, inside, wherever you are, stand up now, and I'll lead you in a prayer. <laughs> all right, all of you that are here, pray word. this prayer out loud after me. This is a prayer of commitment to Jesus Christ. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me now. Pray this, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've broken your commandments. I have fallen short of your standards. But you went to the cross, died for my sin, and you rose again from the dead. I turn now from my sin. I put my faith in you. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward. I want to be your disciple and your child and your friend. Thank you for calling me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you that stood and prayed that prayer.
damn bitch it out of here. Oh my, man, I fucked up. Damn. No. Man, I fucked up. Man, I'm fucking up. No. Man, this guy really fucked up. He gonna put me in on pressure. Man, what is this dumbass doing? I saw death become of light and life become of fire. Yeah. I saw it from a hiding place within the quagmire. I bring it forth the drama and it's Man, this is really starting to fucking piss me off. The battle of the Balrog no. and the mighty light. Get that whore out of here. Uh -oh. Get that whore out of here. Get that damn whore out of here. Yeah, this is a good game right here.
lights up the carnival of pain. I endeavor to watch the panic, but I worry that I will faint. Cause you just fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> kiss, kiss that whore goodbye. Mm. And kiss that bitch goodbye, you dumbass. Pieces out running, one run, run right after the other. Mmm! 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 <laughs> Dumbass! Man, I fucked this. Hole! He was win he, he was so winning that game. <laughs> what a dumbass. <laughs> Man, he told it a whole fucking. Oh. 
They call a name.
night. Oh, oh. Man, look at this fucking shit. That was fucking stupid. That was fucking stupid. <laughs>